In the early 1960s, a grassroots movement to change the laws began to spread across the nation. The first call to action was inspired by one woman, Pat McGinnis. Pat worked in a hospital where she saw hundreds of women admitted with complications from illegal abortions. Pat's way was to reach people one by one with information about legalizing abortion. Do, do you uh, approve of abortion for any reason? Some 100,000 women every year, this is California women alone, subject themselves to improperly or illegal abortions. I think that in itself is a rather staggering figure, and I feel great indignation as a woman to think that women have to subject themselves to second-rate medical care for a safe surgical procedure. She named her fledgling organization the Society for Humane Abortion. Throughout the 1960s, the struggle for abortion rights became one of the fastest growing social movements in the history of the United States. People were willing to challenge the law and, if necessary, risk arrest. Some of us felt very strongly and said, we, I think we ought to break the law. I think we ought to, to counsel women and help women get abortions, even if it's against the law. With a group of 21 clergy, Reverend Moody organized a free referral network to provide counsel for any woman with an unintended pregnancy who needed help. I felt that I could make a case to be there for her, whatever her decision was, not just, not just if it were for abortion, but if it were having the child and giving it up, or if it were for having the child and not giving it up and keeping it. Whatever it was, we would try to help her find a way to do that. And that as, as religious people, uh, as people who cared about people's spirits, there was no way that you could do that without caring about their bodies. Religious leaders across the country began to speak out about women's rights. One of the mistaken notions about the 60s is that we were primarily a civil rights movement. The better term would have been human rights, because we talked all the time about dignity and freedom and justice. For a woman not be counted as being able to make adequate decisions, medical, spiritual, moral, about herself, about her own well-being, about her family, of course, is a denial of a, of a woman's basic uh, uh, humanity, basic ability, basic uh, God-given given rights. As public awareness grew, state legislatures across the country began to discuss changing the laws. In New York State, pro-choice activists managed to bring the issue to the floor for a vote. There are many who say that this bill is abortion on demand. I submit that we have abortion on demand in the state of New York right now. Any woman that wants an abortion can get one. And the real difference is how much money she has to spend. If she has $25, she has it done here under the most abominable circumstances. And if she doesn't have the $25, she can abort herself. And regretfully, this is happening more often than you or I like to admit. The final roll call showed a tie. As the Speaker of the House raised his gavel to announce the bill's defeat, George Michaels asked for the floor. Mr. Speaker. Michaels. Assemblyman George Michaels represented a predominantly Roman Catholic district. His constituents expected him to vote against the bill which he did. I had hoped that this would never come to pass. I fully appreciate that this is the termination of my political career, but what's the use of getting elected or re-elected if 
if you don't stand for something. I cannot, in good conscience, stand here and be the vote that defeats this bill. I therefore request you, Mr. Speaker, to change my negative vote to an affirmative vote. George Michael's vote did end his political career, but for thousands of women who lived in New York and for those who could afford to travel there, abortion was now legal. The vote in New York laid the groundwork for the Supreme Court decision, Roe versus Wade. Sarah Weddington was a recent law school graduate when she decided to challenge the abortion law in Texas. That case became Roe v. Wade. I will never forget the night before oral argument because I was so nervous. Uh, I had done a few uncontested divorces. I had done wills for people with no money, and I had done one adoption. That was the entire sum of my legal experience. But I had spent three years almost getting ready to stand before the U.S. Supreme Court. The issue of abortion had personal meaning for Sarah. When she was in law school, she and her future husband went to Mexico for an illegal abortion. I was in the courtroom, and I had a flashback to that clinic in Mexico, and then my determination that no woman should have to go through that, and that I would do anything I could to see that that was not necessary. We are not here to advocate abortion. We are here to advocate that the decision as to whether or not a particular woman will continue to carry or will terminate a pregnancy is a decision that should be made by that individual. That in fact, she has a constitutional right to make that decision for herself. In recent years, efforts to limit abortion rights have been focused on legislatures and the courts. In the last decade, more than 350 laws restricting women's reproductive rights have passed. Women are finding it difficult, once again, to get safe care. In Kentucky, as in more than 30 other states, abortion funding is only available in cases of rape, incest, or life endangerment. This young woman faced serious obstacles when she wanted to terminate a severely abnormal pregnancy. We went for the ultrasound. Dr. White was telling me how some babies were born without a kidney, some babies were born without a heart or, you know, an organ. And then she, she said, well, your baby was without a brain tissue. That was the hardest thing I've ever heard in my life. To spare Angela the trauma of giving birth to a baby with no chance of survival, she decided to end the pregnancy. She soon learned that the several thousand dollar medical bill would not be covered by Medicaid. Working with the ACLU, Angela did win payment for the operation. There's a very passionate group in this state who are against abortion for any reason at all, ever, period, never. Um, there's nothing in this world that's that black and white. And you're dealing with people who are not involved with a medical situation trying to make blanket decisions. If you've ever looked into a woman's eyes when you've just told her that her baby is doomed, it's, if they could see that, they would know why this has to be kept safe and legal and why we don't need more barriers for these women 